So now we have this battle that took place between 1841 and 1879, and eventually Michael and his hosts overcame Aramon and his hosts and thrust them into humanity. So that's the dragon that we always That's see. the dragon, the actual dragon. And the interesting thing is, is that in the latest Harry Potter movie, mm -hmm. there's a very dramatic rendition of that, of Aramon in that movie. Right. Because at the beginning of the, and Michael, okay, because at the beginning of the movie, Harry Potter and his two sidekicks, now see, I don't know the names of these people, you know, because I've never read any of the books, and this is the only, <laughs> this is the only Harry Potter movie I've ever seen. Which one? It's Ron Weasley the, the and Hermione, one. it's his sidekicks. Right, so, but that's, yeah, I'm talking about the theme here, is what I'm really interested in. So they are, they're, they're at this desolate shoreline, and there's a house there, kind of a ramshackle, kind of rickety place. And Harry Potter wants to find somebody. And they go into this room and there's this gnome-like creature, dwarfish creature, sitting in a chair, somewhat ancient. And he knows where this location of this particular person that Harry Potter wants to find. But he wants a deal, you know? And I said, I want... And they start, and Harry Potter offers him this sword that belongs, is in the possession of some other wizard. And the dwarf says, no, that's not the real sword. It's a facsimile. And Harry Potter says, well, where is the real sword? And the dwarf points up over to the corner of the room, and there's a sword standing up against the thing, against the wall. And Harry says, well, I'll give that to you. You can have it. So the guy tells him where to find him. They all do their magic trick and they all go off. So now we fast forward to the very end of the movie. And the arch fiend, the nemesis of Harry Potter, is this real aramonic looking character. Because Steiner describes how Aramon looks. I mean, how you should draw him. Connect it. And, and I have a photograph that I took on a hike in Sequoia. Now, you know, I just took tons of photographs. I just take, wherever I go, I just take photographs. And so when I'm looking at this particular photograph, after I put it up on my, my um, screensaver, lo and behold, there is Armand, rendered by the mineral kingdom, the gnomes. Perfect, perfect uh, rendition as described by Steiner of Aramon's face. And he's got a long sloping forehead that goes right to his nose. I mean, you know, it just, the nose it just goes straight down. And he's got a very supercilious, sneery kind of, you know, gest gesture around his mouth. He's very, very clever. That does sound like the character. I've seen pictures of, of the movie. Yeah, but look, his forehead is not sloping enough. Okay, but it is puffy. It's interesting to note that he doesn't have the and nose. The nose goes straight. Yeah. That's why I said it's an aromatic feature this yeah. guy has. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's not quite right, you know. Yeah. And he definitely has the, the sort of the sneer. sardonic sneering kind of like, you know, I'm really superior to you in every respect. <laughs> and don't you ever forget it. <clears throat> and in fact, Araman considers Michael totally stupid. You know, he really does. So, now, the interesting thing about this arch nemesis is that he has a pet. And this pet is a serpent. And it's a massive serpent. It's as long as this rope with a great big head and it's totally black. And he takes it with him, you know, it's, it's slithering along beside him. But, the real dramatic thing about it is he clicks his finger and says to the snake, he's got a name. The serpent has a name. In the movie? Yeah. Okay. And he does this and says, come, and the snake goes right up his spine and disappears. Totally awesome. Wow. Right. So anyway, so at the very end of the movie, Harry Potter has, my impression is that Harry Potter has decided to sacrifice himself for the good of everybody in having the battle with this arch fiend. So they're having this battle with their wands, right? 
and all the people in the from that big building that they they have their you know sort of a town I guess in the their wizard school are all hanging around watching this thing and trying to come in and help Harry Potter defeat the arch fiend, but the snake keeps them at bay. Hmm. And then just out of nowhere, I mean out of absolutely nowhere, the sword appears on the ground. The sword that we saw at the beginning of the movie. And this is this tall, gangly, kind of goofy looking fellow. That's sort of like, you know, sort of a little bit kind of off kilter mentally. That's the impression I got from him. He sees the sword and he picks it up and he walks over and the snake's not looking at him and he locks its head off. Psh! I mean, perfect! Mm -hmm. And then Harry Potter defeats the arch enemy. Mm -hmm. And so forth and so on, you know. So, but I mean, that's a, and, so, and there's no question that it's happening. So the earth is a reflection of the psyche. You know, emotional makeup of the population that is living on the earth, of which there is no question that is the case. And it's acting through the etheric forces. So, now, but just get back to the elementals. What we have to participate in with the elementals is to recognize and acknowledge their presence, because they're begging us to, to loosen them from their enchantment. Now, if we don't do that, the dragon that's in our bowels devours them. Mm -hmm. And this is the consequence. Wow. Spiritually, this is the consequence spiritually. No human being would ever arrive at the silly belief in a purely material outer world as assumed by nature research today. He would never come to accept dead atoms and the like. He would never assume the existence of such reactionary laws as that of the conservation of force and energy or the permanence of matter were not the dragon in him to absorb these elemental beings from without. Wow. When these come to be in man, in the body of the dragon, human observation is distracted from what things contain of spirit. Humanity no longer sees spirit in things which in the meantime has entered into him. He sees nothing but dead matter. Oh. Psychically, everything a man has ever expressed in the way of what I must call cowardice of soul <laughs> cowardice of soul where is it? I've lost the thread here. Results from the dragons having absorbed the elemental powers within him. Oh, how widespread is this cowardice of the soul. And <coughs> that M example is a perfect example of that cowardice of the soul. When he wrote this, how long ago? Let's see one of these lectures. This is a, from a really great series of lectures called Michaelmas and the Soul Forces of Man. And it was done in, it's actually called the, the better, the, actually the better title is Michael was in the human gamut, G-M-U-T, which means the mind, the mind-heart forces of the soul of humanity. Yeah, you know what that gamut means, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a very unique German word, and there's no actual one. G-A-M-U-T. G-E-M-U-T. G E Gamut. Gamut. Mind, what did you say? Mind, heart, and soul forces? M the mind, heart, forces of the soul. The mind, heart, source, force of the big right. moot. 27th of September to October the 1st, 1923. Wow. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing because it's so prevalent. It you is. You see it everywhere. But see, I mean, you do it, and you especially see it in macrobiotic. I mean, yeah. really, you do. I mean, people just refuse to look at the spiritual in everything. Yes. Wouldn't it be though so appropriate that, see, 1879, that there was that... It, battle. Yeah, but there's that outpouring like in the 1920s of these people who were enlightened by what they received and they were talking about it. 
Like in right. 1923. Right. right. But the thing is, that what Steiner talks about there is that the Michael impulse should have taken hold right. in 1880. Right. And if it had done, we would never have had the First World War. Right, but it, but it was, right, well, I can understand that. But the, the other, what you're just talking about now, the depth of the dragon wrapped around the bowels. So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there's no Potentially, question. we could be way better off eating well. <laughs> At least that helps. Well, you're kidding me. I mean, not only that, you have ginger compress, but we'll get into that when I do the lecture on digestion and blood alcohol. The ginger compress, I forgot. You, <laughs> you forgot. You can't forget that. It's been a busy season. <laughs> That's I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then, so now, here. so sci psychically, okay, this cowardice of the soul, which is very prevalent, and you see it every day. I mean, I read blogs all day long. Well, not exactly, but a lot. You know, I spent a couple of hours. Well, about all this financial, this financial stuff that's going on, and nobody wants to, does have the courage to say, all right, it's over. Right. Nobody wants to say that. Right. They want to talk about reform and making the rule of law come back and, you uh, know, electing people in the Congress that can do it. Uh, oh, come on, it's just uh, it's over. Yeah, well, better if they could do it, but they won't be able to do it. Not unless they take up the mica of impulse in their souls, they will not be right. able to do it. Well, but you see, the point is, is that if, as long as we refuse to take the Michael impulse into our souls as a living will force, meaning we are going to do Michaelic deeds, we will be this by necessity forced into doing that by the calamities that approach us if we don't do it. Well, the calamity, I think, I mean, just not, I mean, just discussing, the calamity is going to come. Because... No. Because nobody wants yeah. to take up the spiritual. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm right here with you. I'll, I'm ready. I'm getting ready. So these Michael deeds are? Well, that's one of them. The very fact that we are... See, Michael is actually not... Uh, uh, he doesn't... He doesn't... How should we say? Lead us by the hand. He says, okay, this is it. I've given you what you need. I want to see the results of what you're going to do with what I've given you. So he's looking... It's, you were talking about the courage, right? Courage, yeah, an audacity. A doctor or a whatever, and that's over. Because it's counterproductive. It's anti-life. So I, I feel like I feel right in there right now. You know, and so it's like, oh yeah, so I got a mansion on the hill, I got a country club membership, and I go to the Bahamas for three weeks every year. Over. Sorry. You know? That's, that's what it's going to take for people to... And I mention this in my book. I talk about that as a health-giving impulse to say no to those livelihoods which are destructive of the environment of humanity. And how many of those are there? More than there are. countless. <laughs> Well, you do it because it's your job, you know? No, you can't do that. Right livelihood, Buddha called it. You know, one of the eightfold path. So, this disdain of comfort, that's a mycalic impulse, totally. And then physical comfort, I don't think it's really what matters. Because obviously, Araman has given us a great deal with regard to physical comfort. And without which we would be in a very bad way. <clears throat> so I don't think you're talking about physical comfort. I think you're talking about psychic and emotion, emotional and spiritual comfort. <clears throat> we know quite well what we should do in this or that. As such, a, as such a thing is the right thing to do in a given situation. But we cannot bring ourselves to do it. A certain dead weight acts in our soul. The elemental beings in the dragon's body are at work in us. And physically, man would never be tormented by 